Hello and welcome to Health Live at Seniors today. We are delighted to have here with us once again, Dr. Eric Bojas. Eric Bojas, you know, is a leading cardiologist, but today he is wearing a different hat and speaking with us, that of Honorary Chairman at the King George V Memorial Trust. Uh, the trust of which he is the Honorary Chairman uh, has just set up the Sukun Nilaya Center which offers palliative care services addressing the needs of non-cancer patients. We are going to have Dr. Bojas take us through the uh, uh, Sukun Nilaya Center and talk to, about, talk to us about the various palliative care services for uh, uh, non-cancer patients. How is it different? Uh, you know, perhaps uh, the other facilities that are available in a city like Mumbai or in, in, in India in general, and, uh, and, and loads more. So uh, welcome to Health Live at Seniors Today, Dr. Bojas. Thank you so much, uh, Pradyuman. It's a pleasure to be with you always, and it's a delight to see your smiling face. I wish, uh, I wish we could meet face to face, and these meetings would be so much better if you could make eye contact with, uh, with your audience. But uh, be, it, be that as it may, I guess we have to do uh, with whatever we are served up with. And I'm delighted to be here. I was extremely happy to speak a few months ago when you invited me to speak on affairs of the heart. But as you said, you know, today I'm wearing a different hat. And uh, I would be very happy to talk to you about, uh, you know, what we are trying to do at uh, King George V Memorial. Okay. So, if I may, I would like to, uh, you know, share my screen with you guys. Yes, please. No? Uh, Dr. Yeah. So, if we can do that, I might be able to... Um, let me see. Okay. Right. So, <clears throat> I hope you can see my screen. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, uh, now you can see here that... Uh, uh, we at the King George V uh, Memorial, where I am the uh, uh, honorary chairperson, I have been in this, uh, at this trust for about nine years now. And over the last two or three years, I've taken over as chairperson of this trust. Now, I am sure that many of your viewers must be wondering, where on earth is this trust? You know, they confuse it with King George Memorial Hospital. They confuse it with KEM Hospital. They confuse it with, you know, all kinds of things. But I will, I will, you know, slowly reveal to you the truth about this gem that is hidden away right in the middle of Bombay under your very noses. In order to make it even more tantalizing, may I, may I tell you also that we have seven acres of land right in the middle of Bombay in the Worli Mahalakshmi area. Now that makes it even more tantalizing, but all will be revealed as I walk you through the uh, King George V Memorial Trust and its various activities. One of which, and the most recent one, is the Sukun Nilai Palliative Care Center. As the word Sukun suggests, it is tranquil. It's an, it's a, oasis of tranquility, peace, harmony. And that is what people who need palliative care are meant to experience. They need the tranquility, the peace, and the harmony. And if you look at the emblem of Sukun Nilai, right on top, you will see that it's the emblem of a little butterfly, you know, Trying to, trying to alight on a flower. And that's exactly what a patient who deserves and needs palliative care should be doing. He should be looking to alight on a flower, a thing of beauty, tranquility, in order to get peace. Now, this trust, which started Sukun Nilai, uh, at the King George premises is very happy and honored to collaborate with the Sipla Foundation. 
and uh, i must say a big thank you to sipla for helping us you know financially to make this entire project uh, viable i am also grateful for a very magnificent uh, donation from the uh, queen's necklace rotary club of mumbai so once again a big thank you to them as well now when we talk about the need for this center you will be surprised to know that this center palliative care center has been crafted to deal with non cancer palliative care patients now i want to reemphasize that the patients who we will treat at the sukun nilaya center are those that do not have cancer and this is the only and i repeat the only center that deals with non cancer patients in greater bombay and in the mumbai metropolitan region so if you need palliative care and you do not have cancer welcome welcome to the sukun nilaya care center where you will be given all the various modalities of care and treatment that constitutes so called palliative care okay now i am sure that uh, all of you know something about palliative care but i would like to propose that the term palliative care should be changed to supportive care and let me tell you why i think that when palliative care started many decades ago it was constituted to be a therapeutic arm to treat those people who were suffering from cancer and whose disease was beyond control and beyond cure so they could not be helped by medical treatment or surgical treatment or radiation treatment and these poor people were in a lot of discomfort pain disability and so on and they needed help they needed pain relief they needed relief from various symptoms of abdominal obstruction and so on and so forth the symptoms are too too many and too vast for me to go into the details of but they needed help and therefore they were referred to a new branch of medicine that was called palliative care and for decades and even now there is an association in the minds of medical people and the lay people for them palliative care is cancer wrong palliative care does not necessarily mean that the patient is suffering from cancer and let me tell you why let me tell you why you will also be surprised to know that there is no palliative care course in medical colleges there is no palliative care that is taught to you at the post graduate level you acquire as you go along certain concepts and certain precepts of palliative care which of course needs to change and i am happy to tell you that more and more countries and more and more universities are now offering training in palliative care at the diploma level at the degree level and sooner or later you will have plenty of physicians of uh, you know available who can practice palliative care in the way it should be practiced but as of today most of the palliative care 95 to 98% of the palliative care deals only with cancer 
and there is this huge number of patients you know who need palliative care but do not receive it and it is to address this huge unmet need these people crying out for help that we decided that we would craft a palliative care center to deal with this huge unmet need now you can going to ask me that the very obvious question where are these patients and which are these patients and uh, here we are this is just a very brief list the list is enormous i don't think i can cover every single uh, condition that uh, you know you could you could sort of fit into the palliative care spectrum but let's take neurological diseases you know each and every one of us who's uh, listening or who has joined this webinar will know one or more people you know who are reasonably close or not so close who have had strokes and who have got disability secondary to a stroke or you may know somebody with uh, dementia and the most famous of all the dementias is the so called alzheimer's disease and we are seeing you know many many people suffering from uh, dementia and then you have people with parkinson's disease many many people all kinds of disability secondary to parkinson's disease those with spinal cord injuries following motor vehicle accidents or other accidents they end up with uh, paraplegia loss of function in both the lower limbs loss of function in all four limbs which is called quadriplegia they lose bladder control they are incontinent they lose bowel control they are immobile they are in wheelchairs and so on and so forth a pretty bad state of affairs then you have those with muscular diseases the so called dystrophies and you have those with neuropathies so you can see if you only look at the neurological conditions that can demand palliative care you have a huge range today if i ask you uh these these people who have a stroke are they not getting cared for by their uh, neurologist of course they are getting cared for by the neurologist of course the neurologist is giving them the various tablets and other advice that they would need but palliative care goes one step further than that palliative care takes care not only of the body it takes care of the mind so you have psychological support you have physical support you have physiotherapy you have emotional support you have counseling you have a whole range of uh, supportive care and more importantly the care is also spills over to the care giver the care giver the home care giver the primary care giver is involved in every aspect of the care right from the start that the person opts to be treated by the palliative care system and today for example if a person checks into the sukun nilai facility he is not allowed to check in all by himself or herself because that would be just like putting a person in a nursing home no we need a caregiver and that caregiver will be trained by our staff to look after that patient and achieve the best possible result in terms of his nutrition in terms of his physiotherapy in terms of his mobilization etc etc so it's it is a partnership between the palliative care giver and the palliative care giver is a physician we have occupational therapists we have physiotherapists we have counselors we provide all kinds of disability enhancing i mean disability devices which reduces uh, disability and enhances mobility and other 
other affected uh, movements. And of course, the big thing in uh, Sukhu Nilai is that this treatment is completely free. We do not charge any professional fees. We do not charge any admission fees. We do not charge for food, water, or any of the services of Sukun Nilay. So it's completely free. That's another thing that I want you people to understand. Now, after having finished the neurological aspect of it, you come to kidney disease. There are hundreds of people in the city who need dialysis and those who have failed kidneys but do not need dialysis or those who have failed kidneys need dialysis but are not willing for dialysis. So you have a huge gamut of people. And of course, they are being well treated by the nephrologist, gives them all the advice that they need, medicines and diet and so on and so forth. But that is only the beginning of the treatment. It's like a pyramid. The nephrologist is right on top. The base is palliative care. So this is something that all of you need to know, understand, and appreciate. So look at look at the next thing, lung disease. Now, you know, emphysema, rampant because of the heavy smoking that, that uh, you know, we Indians are known, known to be addicted to. And now with the COVID destroying lungs, we are going to have a whole bunch of people with lung fibrosis who are going to need palliative care. They are going to need physiotherapy of the lungs. They are going to need nebulization. They are going to need a whole bunch of respiratory care, which their physician is not able to do. He's going to prescribe the treatment. But that treatment has to be followed, supervised, executed, you know, in a partnership between palliative care, the caregiver, and the patient. Similarly, with liver disease, orthopedic disease, rheumatologic disease, and a whole bunch of other conditions. So I hope I have been able to, you know, put before you the concept of palliative care in the non-cancer group of patients. And you can expand that list 20-fold and still you will not be able to cover the entire list completely. Uh, I am sure, you know, I, I am by, by, by default, I am a senior citizen and uh, this is a seniors program. So I guess a large number of people watching this program would probably be seniors. You know, statistically, 80% of us, me included, 80% of us are going to be needing or will need for sure some kind of palliative care in our lifetime. So you can imagine, you do the math and you'll see how many patients, potential patients are out there. And yet, Sukunilaya is the only center that we have in Bombay, just one that we have in Bombay and in the Bombay metropolitan area. So you can imagine, I, I predict, I hope I'm right, I predict that we will have a tsunami of patients, you know, who will overwhelm and overrun our facility and I am prepared for that. Unlike what we see around us right now in the pandemic, I'm prepared for it because I have kept aside in King George a whole one and a half acre of land to build a facility if I need to build that. And if this center succeeds and I'm able to uh, show the population at large that we can do a much better job than we are doing in the city as far as dealing with these patients are concerned. You know, at some stage, this center will grow into a center of excellence. We will have all the various branches of palliative care under one roof. 
we will have hospice care as well which is care for those people who are about to pass on into the next world make them comfortable that is a separate facility we are going to have respite care where people can be kept for short periods of time to give them and their family help you know because they this can become everybody becomes so exhausted that you can't really manage these patients anymore so keeping the entire gamut into focus we hope and pray to be able to build a much bigger facility if god is kind and if the citizens of bombay and the surrounding areas feel that we are doing a good job having said that okay let me show you let me show you what and where we are now you can look at this it says the king george fifth memorial infirmary 1938 yes this infirmary was built in 1938 83 years ago it's been in existence since then and this infirmary was coupled at the time of the british with what they called was a beggar's home so we had the infirmary and we had the beggar's home which dates back 80 odd years the beggar's home somewhere down the line we don't know where because we have no records that uh, disappeared okay but what we were left with was this infirmary and we were left with 30 odd barracks you know what i mean by a barrack it's an old army barrack i'll show you a picture of one of them old army barrack big huge spaces which nobody knew what to do with and so we decided let us start the palliative care center let us house it in the infirmary so that's what we did we housed the current sukun nilay palliative care center within this infirmary i will show you what it looks like we will talk about the facilities that we have available but i want to show you something that will really startle you in a very pleasant way look at this this is what all our land 7 acres looks like this is bang in the center of mahalakshmi all of you are aware of the famous studios in mahalakshmi all of you are aware of what is now called senapati bapat marg which used to be called tulsi pipe road all of you are aware of haines road which is now called e moses road this property on which king george fifth memorial stands is at the corner of senapati bapat marg and e moses road right next to famous studio and we have 7 acres of land and look at the beauty of this land you walk in you cannot believe that you are within bombay the first time i walked into this land i said wow i can't believe that this exists in bombay just look at it this is the kind of barrack that you can see just look at the beauty of this whole place does it remind you of mathuran or mahabaleshwar it certainly does me it reminds me of that just look at this now once you look at this space all right guess what thought crossed my mind i said we are dealing with suffering humanity okay so suffering humanity needs tranquility needs needs peace needs etc etc so with my committee we just passed uh, a resolution that we would convert a significant amount of this verdant beautiful land into what will be in a very short time called the garden of tranquility so we are going to build little ponds little small fountains lovely exotic plants and we are going to have in the center of this a butterfly garden so we're going to be planting plants which attract butterflies and this is the next project that you know we are going to be tackling to try and give back to the city of bombay the smog ridden 
pollution affected city a garden of tranquility and can you imagine these people who are suffering coming and sitting out here sipping a hot cup of tea surrounded by beauty tranquility butterflies nothing is more exhilarating than having a butterfly come and sit on your head or on the tip of your nose and i've had that experience in other gardens of tranquility which i've had the pleasure and privilege of visiting so i know what it feels like now i need to spend just a few minutes if i may to tell you what the vision of uh, the king george v memorial trust is so you, you you can read it i don't need to i don't need to to read it to you but the vision was to help the disadvantaged and the marginalized to build a sanctuary for them a sanctuary of hope and love there's so much of hate in this world so much so much of despair so much of suffering so our vision was to do something for that you know make them make them make this whole place a sanctuary for caring and sharing and in order to achieve that vision we thought that it would be our mission to build you know something special and to provide a safe and secure environment not only for the inmates of the infirmary but also to collaborate with non profit organizations who are doing wonderful world in in this space in the space of caring and sharing in the space to help the disadvantaged so we collaborated with nine non profit organizations i will just name one or two of them the national association of the blind the cancer pain the patients aid association om creations ored who deals with the with the hearing impaired you know the ratna nidhi charitable trust the jaipur foot and so on and so forth we have a bunch of them nationally and internationally recognized uh, organizations you know who partner with us and who make this entire campus an oasis of peace tranquility and hope so we hope to continue to do that and sukun nilaye is one more step in that direction okay now what are the objectives of sukun nilaye uh basically compassionate care for those who require it supportive care is what i like to call it supportive all care is compassionate but this is supportive care support every aspect of their lives of physical psychological sometimes financial okay and we need to spread awareness we need to spread awareness and i hope with today's meeting we we have achieved some kind of uh, awareness among those of you who are watching and i hope that you will convert this little bit of awareness that i have been able to give you i hope into a tsunami of awareness let let's spread the word that there is something like this available and let us do something with it and for it and the services that we have in uh, sukur nilay is an inpatient department where we admit uh, patients and their caregivers now let me say a couple of words about this because of the current pandemic it is we are obligated to check the uh, uh, virus status of each one of the caregivers or the patient who is admitted so they are obliged to have an rt pcr test done both the caregiver and the patient before they are admitted to the inpatient facility of course they are they we have you will see the we'll see the facility when when i when i show you more photographs but they are extremely comfortable uh, god was kind we managed to get uh, 
raise money to air condition this ward completely. So they are they are living in with the, with air conditioning in this very hot, humid, in, you know, conditions which which exist right now. We have motorized beds. We have wonderful mattresses. We have wonderful nurses. We have physiotherapists. We have occupational therapists. We have the works. Okay, and all this for free. Then we also offer an outpatient service where people who don't need to be admitted, but who need maybe counseling, maybe a little advice, maybe a little physiotherapy, can come to our OPD, you know, have themselves registered, and we will provide them help. We can also give some of them, you know, some, some medicines which we, you know, we can't promise free medicines for everybody and for every kind of medicine. But those that we can, we will be happy to do. We do teleconsultations now because of the uh, uh, pandemic. And maybe we'll, have, we'll continue to offer this service even after the pandemic is over. We have uh, free drugs, as I said, you know, as and when we can, we can provide them. We also give them medical equipment and support. We, can, we give them nebulizers, you know. If they can't afford nebulizers, we get them for them. Uh, oxygen concentrators we've given to some patients, wheelchairs, mobility devices, and so on and so forth. We try to help to the maximum possible extent. If we don't have it, we make every effort to obtain it for them. So it is like uh, if, if they register with us and they take our treatment, we do our utmost to help them in every which way. Uh, occupational therapy for those people who need it, physiotherapy for those that need it. We train the caregivers in every kind of care that they would need to offer to the person that they, they love and whom they are caring for. Okay, And then we impart training to non-medical people. Okay, We're going to be running courses for nurses in palliative care. We're going to be running courses for uh, physiotherapists, we're going to be running courses for occupational therapists and so on and so forth so that they, they understand what palliative care is all about. They've heard the word, they've heard supportive care, but they don't know what it actually entails. And they are in need of special training, which we hope to be able to impart to them and they, in turn, can then pass it on to other people whom they deal with. Okay. Now, this is what it looks like. Isn't that impressive? This is the interior of the facility on the day it was inaugurated. And that's why the red carpet. We don't have the red carpet normally. It was inaugurated. And uh, it was inaugurated by, and we were, we were very, very proud and privileged to have the chairperson of the Sipla Foundation, uh, Rumana Hamid, who was kind enough to come and uh, inaugurate the center for us. So you can see the kind of beds we have. They are all, you know, many of them are motorized beds, you know, where you have a little, a little switch and you can make the bed go up, down, etc., etc., like you see in, a, in a, an ultra-modern hospital. We have the false ceiling, which you can see. We have these wonderful curtains, which are fire-resistant curtains. The whole ward is air-conditioned. At the far end of the ward is a toilet block. We have individual you know, toilets there, which are all uh, tailor-made to suit people with disabilities. We have separate bathing areas, again, which are tailor-made to help people with disabilities. So a lot of thought has gone into this facility. And uh, we would be delighted if uh, any of you or all of you decide at some stage that you would like to uh, see our facility. We'll be happy to show it to you, take you around, explain you, explain to you what we have and etc. So I thought you would be happy to see this facility. And I think it looks gorgeous. Uh, here are some pictures of the uh, you know day of it was inaugurated. 
the lady on the top left, the lady on the top left, this uh, uh, very elegant lady is uh, Romana Hamid. And you can see her with our nurses, our palliative care nurses, and more of our staff here who have done a magnificent job to uh, you know, open the center in a, the shortest possible time in spite of the pandemic uh, raging around us. So it was really wonderful. Now, here is what I want you to see. Look at the width of this corridor. You can have a racetrack here. You can play a cricket match here. This is the width of the corridor. And it is my uh, desire that we will shortly convert one, if not more, of these corridors into a respite area for seniors, which means that sooner or later, you know, people who have uh, seniors at home who need a lot of care and who tie down their caregivers to the home because they need constant care, and those caregivers are mentally and physically exhausted, we are going to convert this into a respite center. So we are going to have easy chairs, armchairs, television sets, all that kind of thing to help to keep the seniors occupied, entertained. They can be left here in the morning. It's almost like, I don't like to use the word, but for want of a better word, I'm going to use the word crash. So it would be like a crash that we use for very small children where you can bring the seniors, leave them un in our care, we take care of them, keep them entertained, make certain they take their medicines and their food and whatever else that they need. And then in the evening after a, a respite that you will have uh, from taking care of your loved ones, you can come and collect them and take them back home. So this is the, one of the things that we have in the pipeline but uh, at the present moment, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew. So we're going to start all these in phases and stages. And with your blessings, you know, I'm sure we will be, we'll be able to uh, achieve what we want to achieve. Now, many of you would ask me, what is the postal address? What are your email ID? It's here for, up here on the screen, okay? the address of Sukun Nilay, the email ID, and the mobile numbers in case you want to contact us. You can uh, contact us on these numbers. Uh, the phones are always manned, so you can call anytime. Somebody will, be, somebody will pick up the phone, and uh, you can have a chat with them, and we'll be happy to help you. You can write to us on the email kgbmpcc at gmail.com and we'll be happy to reply to you. Uh, I only hope and pray that you will make use of this facility. Most importantly, you have to open out your hearts, you have to open out your minds. And as far as I am concerned, if you open out your purses, it is so much better for me and for the center because we'll be able to offer you better and better services. All donations are have an ATG exemption for them. So we'll be happy to you know, accept your largesse, your kindness, your generosity, your donations. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Sukun Nilai. And this is Dr. Borges signing off. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have on palliative care, on non-cancer palliative care, and on Sukun Nilai. Thank you very much for your attention. God bless you and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just clap and uh, you know congratulate you, uh, Dr. Borges, for a for fantastic uh, center that you have set up, excellent facilities that one can see. And um, I'm sure with, with your kind of passion plus your expertise, 
you would uh, uh, the center would be uh, uh, you know would be a center of excellence. We have a few questions that have come in, and I'm going to uh, uh, go one by one. Can I start with the question, Doctor? Yes, please. So we have uh, a couple of questions, which have a couple of just comments. One is um, Shiv Shankar Joshi uh, says, "A uh, lot of respects to you, sir. You're doing a very noble and sacred job." Uh, Surendra Mardia says, "Great job, Doctor. Salute to you and your team." Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, not one, but we have multiple questions from uh, Sushma Ware, who asks, "What are the prerequisites?" I'm on a Zoom. I'll call you. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. So we we have a question, a, a few questions from uh, Ms. Sushma Ware, who asks, "What are the prerequisites for admission? Is it like a general ward or separate rooms?" We have the um, we we've seen the photographs, so we know what it's about. uh how many beds are there how long can a patient stay there and what are the facilities for caregivers okay uh let me take it one by one uh we have at the present moment 15 beds okay and uh, the caregivers have a bed under this bed so it is pulled out at night uh with a, it's a, it's a mattress come pullable bed out where we we provide the bed sheets the pillows and everything so the caregiver is is staying right next to their patient okay we normally don't keep patients longer than 15 days and the the, the magic figure of 15 is because we believe that we uh, can and should be able to train the caregivers within that 15 day period to look after the patient you know we are not going to treat this as a long term facility because there is no end to it you know we we can't have patients living there for months and months and months because uh, very soon there won't be any beds left there'll only be long term you know long care facility patients and that's not what palliative care is all about so we have set an arbitrary limit of 15 days so within 15 days we will be happy to train the caregivers on how to look after their patient in the best possible way exceptionally it may go longer than that depending on how the patient is but by and large our target is 15 days we don't have any private rooms etc okay this is what you saw on the on the photographs is what we have doctor i must um, while you were speaking i did a google search and i figured that dr e moses yes also associated with the this facility king george uh, five infirmary right uh, i want to ask you this question in terms of you know the the definition of an infirmary is in a sense uh, infirmary also offers palliative care right because i'm looking at the dictionary definition it's a place where a place where a, as in a school or a prison where sick or injured individuals receive care and treatment so how how different is it from the infirmary word uh, uh see the infirmary word was used by the british you don't you no longer have infirmaries anywhere in the world right this is and this is an old old terminology and it it was registered as an infirmary and it stayed as an infirmary we haven't changed the name and we have 45 people who are so called in uh, infirmarians who live inside the infirmary who are all destitutes who are abandoned at the nair hospital kem hospital sian hospital who have been abandoned there and uh, nobody comes to claim them they can't be occupying hospital beds so they were shifted by the corporation and they still are shifted if such a if such a situation arises to our facility so they are they are looked after there they are fed they are nursed that kind of stuff many of them are reasonably all right to leave the infirmary and go home but they have no where to go so you know we can't put them out on the street if you know what i mean yeah so that's why we have right now we have about 41 or 42 of them in our custody in our care 
what is here is that these people all of them have ongoing life limiting serious diseases and they need special care to help them so we walk with them through their illness providing support right along the way <coughs> right uh, yeah. and you know among the various uh, ailments that you were looking at conditions that you were looking at yes. up front you there was no mention of cardiac uh, care patients yes i'll tell you why i'll tell you why even though i'm a cardiologist right because a cardiac care you know keeps on keeps on evolving so rapidly that what was considered to be untreatable and not curable 5 years ago is no longer the case okay so things are evolving yes we do have patients who need palliative care those people with heart failure for example you know intractable heart failure they are short of breath all the time they have got swelling of the feet there are people with intractable chest pain secondary to you know heart disease of course the they are in need of palliative care yes absolutely but with newer and newer modalities of treatment these number of patients are dwindling okay so of course they are and we will be coming out with uh, the standard operating procedures to deal with these kind of people and of course they will be admitted to our facilities and of course they will be treated no question about it absolutely as i told you i couldn't make an exhaustive list of you know it that's goes right, on and on right. no well, i was just thinking because since you are you know i one know, of the I know, top, I know. Top cardiologists of the city I how know. come you didn't think of uh, well no <laughs> not that i didn't think but it was becoming too exhaustive so i said you know yeah right we have a question from uh, malcolm montero who asked uh -huh. uh, who says for congratulations uh, to dr bojes for an excellent facility and a very noble vision any specific criteria for admission well i'll i'll, I'll put it to you like this uh, you know every every person has their primary caregiver whoever that primary uh, physician is maybe a family physician maybe a specialist etc he or she would be the person who would uh, refer these patients to us okay on the other hand a patient or his caregiver can decide that they would want our opinion as to whether we would be able to help them so they too are welcome normally normally we would like to involve the physician of the patient in every aspect of the care that we suggest you know in the palliative care spectrum we would like to involve them because they are the primary treating doctors we would be giving supplemental treatment and supportive treatment over and above what they would suggest for example a nephrologist would give them the correct medication etc 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 and we will supplement it with a whole bunch of supportive treatment so that in this very holistic way the patient gets a much better deal as far as the treatment is concerned right we have a question from uh, mr narendra acharya he asks how to send a donation how to send a donation okay uh you know we 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 have a you can transfer it directly you can write us a check or whatever so uh, may i tell you mr acharya if uh, i don't know whether you copied down that email or the telephone numbers okay but i would be happy uh, i'm sure uh, pradyuman would be happy to provide my number or my email right. to you if you want to do that and we'll be happy to get in touch with you and uh, you know uh, be happy to uh, accept your generosity at any time okay right and uh, you know what we will be doing is we will on uh, uh, on on monday carry the takeaways uh, you know of this session along with the video okay. so that will have your entire presentation there we will also mention the uh, the uh, you know the phone numbers etc 
uh, uh, in that and uh, people can take advantage of that and you know write to you and uh, and uh, sure absolutely we would and, be and delighted relations are there uh, we would be delighted we would be delighted thank you very much doctor you are in the house and you are uh, you know uh, such a renowned cardiologist so there are a few questions on uh, on cardiology if you uh, uh, don't mind can we ask you a few questions on that well the doctors in the house so yeah go ahead <laughs> so, so the first question that people ask me is doctor you know uh, this entire thing of covid is so very stressful mm -hmm. i do not have any major condition but i think i will soon have uh, high blood pressure and i'm worried about my heart mm -hmm. what do i do well i think uh, we are getting into the realms of uh, preventive cardiology you you don't have anything wrong but you're afraid that you will become uh, uh, hypertensive or suffer from high blood pressure well all you yeah. need to do all you need to do is to eat sensibly if you are overweight cut down on your weight eat sensibly cut down on your salt have adequate sleep yoga meditation if you can go out for some exercise do that or if you can't go out for whatever reason then you can even do plain spot jogging spot running skipping etc so basically aerobic exercises yoga meditation diet and lose weight don't drink too much of alcohol and stop smoking okay that that is the that is the entire list gamut of right. preventive cardiology okay absolutely i think uh, you know your points are uh, all valid and well taken uh, doctor what is the situation right now what is your assessment of the covid situation and what should our uh, you know viewers here and senior citizens in general uh, be doing well i think uh, as far as this virus is concerned and this pandemic is concerned uh I think the best thing that you can do is to avoid contact with as many people as you can. So social distancing or physical distancing, call it what you will, is a must. You must wear a mask, particularly when you are, you know, leaving the premises of your home. You have to take a vaccine because the only way to beat this pandemic is for most of the population to be vaccinated. so since you're a senior citizen you are already entitled for a vaccine so you should take it take both the doses of the vaccine as soon as you can and don't worry about the vaccine it is very safe you know i don't think that uh, you know people are worried about blood thinners you know if i'm having blood thinners can i take the vaccine of course you can take it there's no no issue whatsoever so please go ahead and take the vaccine wash your hands frequently wear a mask keep social distancing and then god willing you'll be safe and once you've got the vaccine on board even if you god forbid do contract covid it will likely to be a very mild attack because all studies have shown that once you've been vaccinated the chances of you getting serious illness or landing up in hospital or god forbid passing on as very 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 small so i think that's a very encouraging thing so please be careful take your vaccine socially distance wear a mask wash your hands doctor i was reading a news item about uh, you know and there are various questions about comparing uh, the vaccines etc and there was a news item that i read about the fact that people who have the covid shield uh, who have taken the covid shield virus vaccination sorry uh, they are allowed entry to uh, uh, qatar but those with a covaxin uh, were not allowed so is there is if a if given a chance of course one is not given the option of choosing but if given the the option should one take covishield uh, i think so i think that 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 makes a, a, a makes that's making a sensible choice see the the problem as i understand it is that until very recently uh, perhaps even now there isn't enough data available on covaxin okay so uh, maybe covaxin is a wonderful uh, is a wonderful vaccine okay i am not saying it's not 
but it's a question of there being not enough data. And today, you know, we believe that, you know, science should be paramount. If you have enough data, the world will accept it. If you don't have enough data, the world is likely to reject it. So we need the data. If you have the data, by all means, you know, the world will accept it. Uh, doctor, for cardiac patients, for people who have had an issue, is there any special care that one must take in this period? Not at all. I think you just have to live life as you have been advised to by your doctor. There is no special do's and special don'ts. Okay. Take all the precautions that you would take to avoid getting hold of the virus. Take your vaccine and hope for the best. But in terms of getting tests done, for instance, you can't really take an ECG. You can't, you know, uh, do all of that with ease. Is there something that you would advise? No, I don't think so. I think if you are, if you have symptoms that bother you, then you know, like let's say you get a lot of chest pain or you're short of breath, you need to see your doctor. You know, who then will decide what is the best, uh, you know, treatment for you. So there isn't uh, one piece of advice fits all situation. It will have to be situational and patient, patient by patient and patient will have to be different, right? So you'll have to go depending upon the local situation. Thank you, doctor, for, uh, you know, answering these questions also. And, uh, all the very best for Sukun Nilai. I think, you know, the objectives with which you have set it up, uh, you know, I hope you meet them. I have one last question to you. Why did it take so much time for something like this to come? And why is it only there at, you know, in a Mahalakshmi? And why not in the rest of the city? Because I think, you know, we need Lakshmi, right? So, <laughs> and, you know, I think health is Lakshmi. If you have health, you have Lakshmi. No, but jokes aside, it's a question of perception. It's a question of perception. Uh, let me put it to you this way, that I have always wanted to start a project like this because I've, I, see, I saw the need for it. Okay. Now, why it hasn't come up anywhere else, I really am not in a position to give you a cogent answer. But I saw the need. And then I jumped into the space when I had the opportunity. God gave me the opportunity. I had the facility. I have the land. I have everything. So why not do it? Okay. So that's the real reason why we jumped into it. And with the support of uh, the citizens of Mumbai, because this facility is built for them. It's not built for me. This is a non-profit, zero-charge facility. It is for the citizens of my beautiful city. It is for them to make use of it. It is for them to allow it to grow. It is for them to make it big. It is for them to enjoy. And it is for their loved ones to be cared for and looked after. And uh, is this is, is, is a setting up of supportive or palliative care facilities is something... Is that something that you would recommend to, you know, more and more philanthropists, more and more hospitals, those who oh, would... Absolutely, because this is a completely neglected branch of uh, medicine, as I told you. It's not even being offered in, in medical school. <laughs> There's no subject called palliative care. It's now being recognized and, you know, people are moving in that direction. So let's hope and pray. Keep. I would strongly recommend that many more philanthropists, you know... Um, you know, organizations who can uh, can do it, they should do it and put up more facilities. No question about that. With that um, ray of hope, thank you very much, Dr. Bojas, for... It's my pleasure. My pleasure, time. Pradyuman. My pleasure. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wish that your audience, uh, you know, carries this message home and beyond their home and make people aware of what a beautiful facility has been created and they should make use of it. That is my I absolutely fervent think, hope and prayer. Absolutely. And I think, you know, facilities like these and with, with such, uh, you know, committed and passionately, uh, you know, uh, uh, competent and, you know, very 
or well known professionals like yourself associated with it i definitely these kind of facilities should be taken care of should be should be uh, one one should use uh, these facilities to their advantage and uh, spread the message and i'm sure our reader our readers our viewers here uh, will do that thank you very much and all the very best thank you so much sir. god bless okay